Ever wonder what Jesus would say if he wrote a letter to our church? What would he say to us? Early in the book of Revelation, the Apostle John tells us of seven letters that Jesus wrote to churches in what is now known as Turkey. We typically think of this region of the world as having always been Muslim, but this is not the case. The region of Turkey was once a place where there were many thriving churches. Why is this not so today? What's happened? The answers may be found in the letters that Jesus wrote to them so many years ago. Each of these letters had application to every first century reader and is relevant to us today. The first of these letters is written to the church in Ephesus. Located on the most direct sea and land route to the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire, Ephesus was an emporium that had few equals in the world. No city in Asia was more famous or more populous. Ephesus was to the Roman Empire what perhaps New York City is to the United States today. It was also significant politically. It was the home of the Roman governor and was frequently the scene of very important trials. Ephesus was a notorious center of pagan superstition. It was famous for the Ephesian letters, amulets and charms which were supposed to be infallible remedies for sickness, to bring children to those who were childless, and to ensure success in any undertaking and people came from all over the world to buy them. In Ephesus, pagan religion was at its strongest. It was the center of worship for Artemis, or Diana. Diana was the goddess of fertility, life, and reproduction, so the worship of Diana was immoral beyond description. The temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Only the foundation and one column remains of this temple, which once measured 425 feet long, 220 feet wide, and 60 feet high. It once had 120 columns that each stood 60 feet tall. The center portion was roofed over with cypress wood and housed the statue of Diana that was considered to be the most sacred of the ancient world. This massive complex was the religious, cultural, and economic center of the city. It contained the Bank of Asia, and ironically was also a haven for hardened criminals who could legally find refuge within its perimeter. The city's economy also depended upon the massive sales of figurines of the goddess Diana. Ephesus also contained an impressive theater that was able to hold 25,000 people. It was originally designed for theatrical performances, but later alterations allowed gladiatorial contests to be held there. It was in this theater that the mob gathered to rally against Paul the Apostle. The Church of Ephesus was probably founded by the Apostle Paul and two early Christians named Aquila and Priscilla. Paul ministered there for more than two years and later left Timothy there to carry on the work. Christian tradition holds that after Jesus' resurrection, the Apostle John brought Mary, the mother of Jesus, to Ephesus where they took up residence during their remaining years. Even today, one can visit what is reportedly the gravesite of the Apostle John. It was in this economically wealthy, politically influential, and religiously corrupt city that a congregation of Christians met for worship, discipleship, and evangelism. And this was one of the churches that received a personal letter from Jesus Christ himself. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right 
to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty, feeling pretty pumped up this morning. Greg uh, found me a better lampstand this week, can you tell? So uh, that's going to be a cool thing to have. We're going to enter into a uh, pretty uh, crazy next seven weeks. And pretty important next seven weeks as we look at the seven churches of Asia Minor. Now, I've got this theory that, that if God wanted to, he could have written seven letters to some other churches. Because there's, there's a lot of churches in this time frame. But I'm pretty sure this is the reason he writes these seven churches are seven examples he can use to build his kingdom. One, to encourage those churches, but also to encourage us and help us. Now, there's some pretty interesting things that go on in this first one with Ephesus. There's some pretty cool things, and we'll get into that. But to get into this, let me give you a little introduction here. First of all, I want you to notice the pattern. In all seven letters, there's this pattern. And here's the pattern. Intro of Christ. You have this intro of Christ in the beginning. And then you, from there, you have a diagnosis of the church. What is going good in the church? What's the church holding on to that's good things, that are helpful things, that are encouraging things, that are things that are solid, that the church can build upon? Except for in one case, one church doesn't get any com commendation and telling of what's going good that we'll deal with in a couple weeks. But then he goes into and he says, here's what you've done good. But then he comes in and says, okay, here's some things that are not going so well, except for two churches. Oh, one church. He doesn't give any, uh, any criticism to, if you will. Our two churches, except for our... So he gives this... So you have this pattern that keeps going on. And we'll see this pattern over and over in the letters. Now we learned a little bit about the church of Ephesus, or the city of Ephesus in the video. But let me give you a couple more things. This is the third largest city in the area. But it's probably the most important city because of it had a port. It had a port where people, where, where ships could come in, they could deliver, and it was on a mail route, a Roman mail route. So you had mail coming into Ephesus, and then it would go out from there, and it would go actually to the seven cities that we're going to talk about, because it was, this, it was a mail route that would go to these seven cities. At the time of the writing of the, of the letter to the church at Ephesus, you have about 250,000 people living in the city. Now, I know it seems pales and compared to some of the cities that we have in, our, in, our, in the world today with millions upon millions of people living in cities, but 250,000 people in a city was a huge city. The, 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 uh, the area was largely agrarian. You think about it. The, the times were largely agrarian people, and so you had most people didn't live in cities. They lived out in the country and, and, and spread out across that area. It's a major city. In Acts chapter 19, Paul came to Ephesus on his third missionary journey. The, resp the city responded with hearty opposition. They didn't really like what Paul had to say. In fact, we heard that it was probably Paul put on trial in uh, Ephesus in the, uh, in the amphitheater. Paul traveled to other major cities because from the, you know, and when you think about it, when Paul goes to the cities, why does he go to the cities? The cities are where culture comes from, right? The cities are where you have culture and commerce. You have things that come into the city. You have things that go, go in, come from the city and spread out from the city, right? When you think about it. You know, we, we see things happening in big cities before they ever happen in other smaller towns. You know, I still can't get Verizon Fios at my house. It's all over. I can see the advertisement, but where I live, I'm still not quite there yet. It hasn't come to my little neck of the woods. It starts in the big cities. Things start in the big cities. Even to this day, things start in the big cities, and they come out from the big cities, and they move out to the rest of the world. They're the city of center of art. They're the city of commerce, center of commerce. They're the city of center of culture. You have in, in center of banking is in the bigger cities. So from big cities, go out everything. So Paul goes to these big cities for a reason. Paul goes in his missionary journeys. He goes into, the, into cities to plant churches, start churches in the cities, and then from there, the churches can spread out and plant more churches throughout the, war, the area and throughout the world eventually. 
And that's what the city of Ephesus had become. It became a church playing center. The church at Ephesus was well known for being a center of education for Christianity in that region. People came to study in the church of Ephesus and from the church of Ephesus, they went out and planted and started other churches or went out and encouraged and pastored other churches. You had pa pastors coming in there. You had this as being a, a major stop. You know, if people were traveling as Christians, they were a major stop. They would go to Ephesus to learn. You know, we go to conferences. This was where the conferences were held. This is where your Bible conferences were held. This is where your study was held. There's a there was a library at the church of Ephesus and there was a library in the city of Ephesus that had hundreds and hundreds of, of scrolls in it. So you had all this education going on in the city of Ephesus. So the city of Ephesus, it's, it's not unique that, that Jesus starts with the city of Ephesus in the church of Ephesus to talk, talk about, his, his, to write his seven letters in Revelation. It's not unique that Paul went to the city of Ephesus as one of his first major starts and stayed in the city of Ephesus for extended periods of time in order to help that church become a strong church. So we got that as our background. So we have Jesus' word to the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in the world of Ephesus. Right. And again, as we read the seven letters, started seven churches, there are a few things that are consistent. One is that every church has an angel. We talked about that last week. That there's seven angels that are over the seven churches. And the seven churches are seven lampstands. And the seven lampstands represents God's light through that church into the world around us. We have a lampstand. We have a light that shines through us because of what Jesus Christ did in us. When he died on the cross, he rose from the grave, and he brought us to salvation. We have a light that shines through us to the world around us. As individual people and as a corporate body, as a church. We are the light in the community we've been planted in. Our lampstand. And I have no doubt that there is an angel that looks over our church. That watches over our church, that helps our church, that battles for our church, that is there for our church. The words of him who holds the seven stars. Now, that's an interesting phrase if you take it. If you don't believe God has a sense of humor, and I believe greatly that God has a serious, funny sense of humor, if he didn't, he wouldn't have created the giraffe. Okay? Just, just, just there. But here's why he has a sense of humor. He says this, Jesus says this, to the angel of the church, or no, he says to the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. This is sarcasm. Right there. It's serious sarcasm. Because he's saying, I've got the seven churches in my hand. I've got the seven stars, which represents the seven churches in my hand. But here's the sarcasm part of it. Domitian, who was the emperor at the time, who had declared him Lord himself, Lord God and King. Okay? Domitian, who also was so arrogant that he before, you know, usually when we, Put, put people on money, presidents on money. It's after they've, they've passed, right? You don't put presidents' faces on money when they're still alive. Domitian was arrogant. Domitian went ahead and had coins made with his face on it, with his image on it. You know what the image was doing? Holding seven stars in its hand. Jesus is being very sarcastic here. I don't love sarcasm. Okay? It's, one of, it's my second language. And I love sarcasm. And when I see sarcasm, I think it's hilarious. And when I see Jesus putting sarcasm in his book, I think it's great. Because here's Jesus saying, I hold the seven stars in my hand. He's looking at the people of Ephesus and saying, Domitian is not the one that's in charge, people. And I'm going to put something in this letter to you that is a direct affront to the king, the, sea, the leader of the world that you live in right now. And I'm going to tell you, He's not in control. That's a serious thing. It's funny. It's hilarious to me, but it's very serious at the same time. It's something we can grab a hold of even today and say, hey, it doesn't matter who's in charge in Washington, D.C. or in Annapolis, Maryland. We know who holds everything 
in his hand. Okay? We worship the God who created everything. We worship a God who's still in control of all things around us. And no matter how crazy this world gets, he's still holding us in his hand. Now, he could have said here, I hold everything in my hand. But he used a little sarcasm and says, I hold the seven stars in my hand. Representing the seven churches, but also a little sarcasm towards Domitian. So we go on from there. Who walks among the seven golden lampstands. It's pretty obvious that Jesus is in the presence of all his churches, right? Jesus is here. He's alive. He's well because he lives within us. So his presence is here. Okay? Pretty evident. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you. So he goes in, he's giving their condemnations, he's telling them, hey, you're doing these great things. But he says, I've got something that, that that's a, there's an issue. Okay, there's an issue. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from this place. He's saying, I'm going to shut your church down. Because if the church cannot be a true representation of who Jesus Christ is, then the church ceases to be the church. It just becomes a gathering of people meeting together to hang out. And God will shut it down. Unless you repent. Yet this you have, and this is, he goes back to a commendation here. Yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans. And I'll talk about them in a minute. Which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And so let's talk about these encouragements real quick. First of all, the first encouragement is they serve faithfully. He tells them that. You serve faithfully. You have patient endurance. You serve these people are hardworking people. They are people who volunteer hours. They are people who serve God, serve Christ in his church on a regular basis. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. They train. They study. They, they are constantly working. They help plant other churches. They help out, send out missionaries. It's believed that the church was the center of training for these things. Most scholars believe that John wrote this book. The book of John, the gospel of John from Ephesus. You have the dispersion from Jerusalem where the Jewish and Christians were dispersed or the Christians were dispersed out of Jerusalem and they scattered all over the place. John, believed to be according to church history, took Mary. You remember Mary, the mother of Jesus, Jesus on the cross told John, here's your mother. And he tells Mary, here's your son. And John, as a son, takes care of his mom. And he takes his Mary away from Jerusalem and takes her to Ephesus. And is believed that's where Mary passed away, is in Ephesus. So you have this, John, it's, it's, it, it, Ephesus is the center of things. And, and, and they serve, the church serves faithfully. He doesn't criticize their service. Because their service is something that they do to the glory of God. And it helps spread the gospel to the world around them. The second thing he tells them that they're doing good is they endure hardship. Truth be told, this is a difficult place to, met, to, to uh, be a, a Christian. Ephesus was not an easy town. Okay, you had some 50 gods and goddesses that were worshipped in Ephesus. You have prostitution that was legalized. It was a very difficult place. You had sacrifices that are going on in the temple of Artemis or Diana. I had to ask my son about Artemis. My son is, my 10-year-old knows more about Artemis than I do, which is kind of a cool thing. The goddess of the hunt, Artemis. She's also the goddess of fertility. 
the, God, the temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, was de finally destroyed. It was destroyed and rebuilt three times. It ultimately finally destroyed about 410 A.D. And you heard the, the massive size of this temple. And here these Christians are serving God faithfully, loving Jesus, trying to serve him, and being the center of all this stuff. And guess what? They're in the middle of one of the toughest places on earth to serve. In the middle of pagan worship, in the middle of, of, of paganism at its worst in so many ways. We can't even imagine how bad it is. We don't have anything that compares to it. As, as bad as our cities are, some of our cities are, as bad as it is for some Christians to serve in certain cities, you know, I'm thinking like Las Vegas, you know? Some of the places like that, Los Angeles, and I've been to Los Angeles before and, and looked at the ministry centers that are serving there and the churches that are serving in, in the L.A. area. It's, it's pretty amazing. But, man, there are some things that are going on in this city that are just absolutely heinous in the eyes of any Christian. And the people of the church are enduring through it. They're staying faithful through it. No matter what. They endure hardship. You have sound doctrine, Jesus tells them. You're not a bunch of heretics. They don't have false doctrine, false teaching. They don't have re they're not reading crazy books. They're not believing myths and fables and folklores. They are not mixing other religions into Christianity, which was very prominent at the time. That's actually what the Nicolaitans were doing. They took Christianity and basically said, okay, yeah, you can come to Christ. But the Nicolaitans basically said, but anything you do with your body, eating or sexually, it doesn't really matter. You can do whatever you want. And that's what the Nicolaitans were teaching. And, and they're, enduring, they're, they're, they're standing strong in their sound doctrine, in, the, in their teaching. And they hate heretics. And they hate the, 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 the Nicolaitans. They hate other heretics. Heretic may seem like a strong word, but heretics are those that are intentionally leading people astray. They have taken the gospel, the core of our beliefs, and basically wrapped it up in a bunch of false teaching. We don't see that today at all, do we? Oh, buddy. Too much, right? And we can talk about other religions that do that. Mormonism or, or, or something like that. You can talk about Mormonism and they've taken the core of the gospel and tried to wrap it up and they've wrapped it up with a bunch of other teachings that are not biblically based. You can talk about even in Christianity. People taking the core of gospel and filling it full of other stuff that doesn't make sense and doesn't work and basically creating, the, creating a, 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 a teaching that f makes you feel good about yourself but doesn't ha require anything of you. Anything of repentance, anything of sacrifice, anything of service to God. We have to be very careful in our, in our, in our structure, our beliefs, that we make sure that the things that are, look like Christianity and act like Christianity are truly Christianity. Okay? You know how a, a, a treasury officer of the United States Treasury knows the difference between a real bill and a fake bill? They don't give them a fake bill and say, here, fill the fake bill, study it. You know what they do? They give them the real thing. And they say, here is a real dollar bill. Here is a real hundred dollar bill. And they study it and they feel it and they know what it smells like. They know what it looks like. They study it so well. They know that hundred dollar bill or that bill so much, so frontwards and backwards. They know every aspect of the bill. And literally they can take and put one in your hand, a fake one in their hands. They know the real one so well, you can put a fake one in their hand and they know it's fake. That's what you need to do with Christ. You need to study him and be on top of your understanding of what the Bible teaches so well that when falsehood enters in, you're able to look at it and go, no, that's not what the Bible says. We're going to get rid of it. We're going to shun that as false teaching. Those are heretics. They've wrapped the gospel up with a bunch of bull and we're going to send it out the door. 
Because it's not appropriate for what we need as followers of Christ. We need to be ready to do that. We need to be so on top of our game and our belief system that we can weed out what is a heretic and what's not. And the church at Ephesus was so strong in doing this. They were so well doing this. And, and, and Jesus tells them, hey, you're doing great. But he comes to the criticism. It's a simple criticism, right? One thing, I mean, he, he just told them a bunch of stuff, a big basket full of things. Hey, you're doing these things great. But then he gives one criticism. You know how that goes, don't you? Oh, your dress looks pretty. Oh, you're, oh, you're wearing that? <laughs> Women, y'all know that, right? That one little criticism or that weird look you might get. And all the good things that you've heard, you could hear a hundred good things and hear one bad thing. And which one do you remember the most? The criticism, right? That's just the way we operate. Jesus gave him a whole basket full and said, here are the things you're doing well. He gives them one criticism. But man, it's a stinging criticism, people. It hurts. It hurts. You are not very loving. Wow. You ever had an argument and presented, and you know the person is correct in what they're saying, but the way they say it, Man, it's just, it's, it's brutal. It's mean. It's hateful. It's angry. You know everything they're saying is true, but the way they present it, it's just not very kind. Okay? That's what Jesus is saying to the church at Ephesus. You have the truth soundly in your corner. But man, what your, the way you're telling people about it, it's just killing them. It's hurtful. Oh, Christianity's never like that, right? We never get hurtful, do we? Ah, yeah. More often than not. You know, one of the biggest criticisms of Christianity right now in the world we live in, they're not very kind, right? They're, we're known for more of what we're against than what we're for. Okay, yeah. Because there's some things out there that are not very, kind, not very good that we need to, need to be against, but we need to be promoting what we're for. What is most important. But they're not very loving. The result is, is it says you have fallen from where you started. This church started between 52 and 54 A.D. by Paul. In fact, in Paul, in Ephesians chapter 1, the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 says this. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. You know, they had a lot of legitimate excuses, right? We live in a hard city. We have a bunch of bad teaching that is all around us. There's a bunch of... of immoral things going on in our city all around us. They had a, every reason in the world to be unloving in the world's eyes, right? To be very harsh people because of all the stuff that's going on around them. And Jesus looks at them and says, you don't have an excuse. You still have to be loving. No matter what goes around or in the in your world around you, goes on and around in the world around you, no matter what people say, no matter what people do, no matter what legislation comes down, we still have to be a loving people. We still have to show the world that Jesus cares and loves them. It's the core of who we are as Christians. It's important to be doctrinally sound but we can't be truly doctrinally sound unless we're doctrinally loving to the world around us. So how in the world can we avoid this mistake? How do we avoid as a church here right now, South End Baptist Church here in 
Frederick Maryland, how do we avoid the mistake of becoming unloving? I think there's some things that we can learn from the church of Ephesus that probably happened in the church of Ephesus. First of all, we must allow truth and love to work together. Truth and love have to be in the same boat at the same time at all times. We can't pit one against the other. Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. Some people are grace people. Some people are truth people. And here is Jesus is saying, I want you to put truth, wrap it around with grace. I want you to love around the truth. Put love around the truth. Some of you are grace people. You love people. You care about people. You empathize with people. When people are hurting, you hurt. When people are in suffering, you suffer. You care about people. And then some of people, some, I would say some of us, because I kind of put myself in, I, I love people, but sometimes it's hard. I'm a cynical person sometimes. It's not a good thing. It's a very bad thing. I, I, and I fall into this trap of, of becoming unloving. Because I, you know, I, I'm a, one of those doctrinally guys that like doctrine, like teaching, like studying, and all that stuff. And I can become unloving. And some people, you know, but, but I need people that are loving in my life in order to help me be more loving. I need my wife in my life who's a loving, compassionate person who, who, who cares about people to be in my life so that I can be a more loving and compassionate person so I can care about people. And don't become so cynical towards people, which I can become. I need my son who's eight years old to come up and jump in my bed and put his arms around me and hug me and tell, tell me he loves me. and helps me become more of a loving person. You know, but we need that balance of both in our lives. We need that balance of both. We need people that are full of grace and love. We need people full, that are full of truth at the same time to work together so that the church can become what God wants it to become. We don't need to be against each other. We don't need to fight with each other. We don't let truth and grace fight and truth and love fight each other. We work allow truth and love to work together. To build God's kingdom. It's a difficult balance sometimes. And we have churches that, well, they're all about love. But they have no truth in them. And we have true churches that are all about truth, but there is not a speck of love in, their, in anything that they do. It's all about staying close to the truth. And we have to balance, do that balancing act in our lives as a church to be truthful but loving. Speak the truth in love. Sometimes that's a hard thing to do, right? So that's one thing that we need to do. We must allow truth and love to work together. The second thing we must do is we must be doctrinally guided by the Holy Spirit. I love doctrine. I love studying. It's an important facet of a walk with Jesus, but here is what can happen. We can become so theologically correct that we miss the Holy Spirit. Because it didn't fit. The Spirit didn't fit within our system. We need to be doctrinally sound and constantly contending for the faith of Christ. We need to be ready to confront doctrinal error, but let's not make the mistake of kicking the Holy Spirit out of the situation. I had a friend of mine in seminary who grew up in the health, wealth, gospel under the teaching. I won't tell you who it is, but a, a very prominent teacher in the health, wealth, gospel. And one day we were sitting there talking. And I said, how in the world? What in the world? He said, Chris, he said, I know everything he, that he teaches is doctrinally just off the rails. But he said this, I thank God that I got enough truth out of him and the spirit used him enough to bring me hit to Christ. Now I realize he's in error. And I realize what he teaches is wrong. But I'm thankful that God allow in his wrongness God's truth to come out. And the spirit worked in that man's heart, in that guy's heart. He's a pastor today. And we have to be careful that we don't get so, you know, like, you, know what, you can't be a Christian. You know, some people, well, you can't be a Christian coming out of that man's teaching. You can't. No, you let the Spirit guide where the Spirit leads. 
You make and ensure that you're working together and allowing the Spirit to guide your teaching, your study, your doctrine. And don't allow the doctrine to frame you into a box that the Spirit can't move. And that's so easy to do sometimes that we forget the Spirit's work in our lives. We should be constantly contending. The Holy Spirit inspired Scripture, inspired truth, inspired what's good, inspired what's loving. The Holy Spirit is God. He dwells in us. He works in us. He guides us. And we need to let Him do that work in our lives on a regular basis. The third thing that we must do is we must must not avoid is we must see the world must not see the world as a we must see the world as a mission field and not an enemy. Never look at the world around us with disdain for the people of the world. We must realize that's a mission field. That's hard, isn't it? When you look and see th people, the things they do, the p things they say, the places they, you know, just all the stuff that is so wrong and so immoral that we see, that we know is not in the God's, what God desires, but we need not look at that, those situations and look at those people with disdain and say, we, we don't like them, we don't care about them, we don't love them. Uh-uh. We have, still have to love those people. Even though they may t say things that are totally antithetical to anything that the Bible speaks of, we must look at those people and say, God loves them and we must love them. We must pray for them. We must let God's light shine in their lives. By the way, how are you doing on your three people? Remember? It's been a couple weeks since I've said anything about this, right? Three people. I gave you a challenge when I first got here. Three people. The three-person challenge. I want you to find, think of three people in your life that don't know Christ. I want you to pray three things for them. That God would bless them. That God would shine his light into their lives. And the third thing is that God would use you in the process. I told you I was going to remind you of it. I failed the last couple of weeks, so we're going to do it right now. Three people, write three people's names. Every day pray for them. Pray that God would bless them, God would shine his light into their lives, and God would use you in the process. Because guess what? God loves people. Even though they may teach something that's totally different than us, even though they may have something immoral in their lives that is totally antithetical to the Christian message, guess what? God still loves them. And we don't look at them as their enemy and we don't look at people who, t who are hate Christianity or don't like Christianity or do things against Christianity as a way to hate them. We look at them and say, God loves them. I need to love them. I need to show grace to them even though they may not show grace to me. We need to look at the world and see them from that way, that perspective. The fourth thing is we must see people as God sees them. His creation. This goes back to the missionary field. It kind of works together. As a parent, my kids are going to do some things along the way that will drive me absolutely nuts. Does that mean I stop loving them? No. People are going to do things in your life around you that's going to drive you absolutely nuts. Do you stop loving them because they do those things to you? No, you don't. You stay compassionate. And you remember that phrase in the scripture. Yet for the grace of God, go I. We know we have lost sight of the gospel message when we have contempt instead of compassion for people. The fifth thing is we must see repentance as a continual part of the Christian life. Repentance is not just something that you do at the beginning of your Christian walk with Christ. It's something you do on a daily basis. You constantly look at the, your life and say, I, I made a mistake here, I need to repent. I made a mistake here. I need to repent. And you constantly look at it and you take your life and you put it in repentance. It must be constant in our lives. 
We become judgmental, critical, haughty when we don't repent on a regular basis because we become this haughty person that thinks we're better than anybody else. When we should be a repentant person that thinks, hey, I'm not that great of a person. Remember what I told you last week? If God knew, if I knew what God knows about you, we'd lock the doors. And if you knew what God knows about me, you'd never walk in the doors. We must have this constant idea that we are not always on the right track and repentance needs to be a part of our lives daily. It keeps us grounded in God's truth. Six, we must not lose our focus on Jesus. We kind of talked about that a little bit last week, didn't we? When we lose our focus on Jesus, we lose our focus on what Jesus did on the cross, what he did from rising from the grave, what he did in his life to bring people to himself, to bring salvation to the world. When we lose our focus on Jesus, guess what happens? We lose our love. When we keep forget about what Jesus did to the woman at the well, when we forget about what Jesus did to the woman caught in adultery, when we forget about what Jesus did for the blind, for the deaf, for the dead and showing love to those people and to the world around him compassion and grace we lose sight of who we are as his followers as loving number seven we must never feel like we're finished you're never going to be fully accomplished in your christian life there is never on this side of heaven there is never a finished product when it comes to following Christ. You must finish well. You must stay motivated. You must stay in tune with what Christ has for your life. I appreciate the fact that Jesus comes to this church, to the church at Ephesus and says, hey, I see what you're doing. But here's where you can approve. I think every church in this world could look at themselves and say, man, we're doing some really good things. But there's some areas that we need to improve on. We need to get better at. Even the churches here, you're gonna, we're going to find a church, there's no criticism. Doesn't mean they're perfect. But what they're doing wrong, they were doing enough right that they didn't need to be criticized for anything they were doing wrong. We're doing that as, at South End right now. We're looking at the history. We're looking at the church and saying, where can we be better? Where can we be serve God better? What we, can we do better for his kingdom? The one part of my job here is the interim. To look at the church and say, okay, hey, great. Y'all are doing some really, and y'all are. Y'all are doing some great things. But where can we improve? Are you loving enough? Don't fall into the Ephesus trap in your life. It becomes very easy to do. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your many blessings on our lives. And we thank you that you have given us your son in the story, in, in, the, in the letters that he wrote to these seven churches. And we pray that as we walk out these doors, that we will truly be a loving church that brings glory and honor to your name and everything that we do. In your son's name. Amen. We're going to sing a final song. And, and we're going to just have this opportunity to, for you to respond to what God's telling you to do. Maybe in your own life you look at yourself and sometimes you know, I'm not a very loving person. And maybe you need to change that or not repentance. Or there's something in your own life that you need to change. Maybe you're looking at your life and going, oh, God, yeah, I'm doing some good things, but just some stuff needs to be fixed. I don't know where you are in your Christian walk, but I pray that today you'll truly turn your life over to him.